Please welcome Brent Bushnell. Brent. Thanks, Brent. Appreciate that. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Cool, guys. Well, I've got one qualifier. I sound like I've been smoking a pack a day for a decade. Uh, I lost my voice over the holidays, and it hasn't come back. So I don't know if this is permanent, but uh, bear with me. Um, so uh, I have as many slides as I have minutes. Uh, David, is 45 minutes, is that right? OK, so I'm going to try to not talk too fast, but I'd love to get through all this stuff. I'd I was going to talk a little bit about how I got here, uh, a little bit about some of our creative process at 2-Bit Circus, uh, and then uh, a, a, a project that we're really passionate about. Um, and hopefully, we'll be able to get through all that. So uh, first of all, this is me. Uh, as like an eight-year-old, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up a nerd. My dad was a nerd, uh, and and you know, you can see like, like a good nerd. I sort of have every single thing I need with me, uh, you know, at a time when that's basically stuffed animals and Star Wars gear. Uh, but uh, and and don't hold it against me, but I. Uh, so, well, let me back up again. So, you know, you grow up a nerd, you sort of want to be able to do everything, right? You want to be able to, to try a lot of stuff. And so as a consequence, I've worked in a really crazy number of, of industries. Uh, I worked programming a DNA synthesis machine, fiber optics test and measurement equipment. I worked as a sushi chef, uh, furniture moving. Uh, it's been a really, uh, you know, auto salvage, which is a domain I didn't even know existed. When you get into a car crash and your, and your car is totaled, that, you know, basically your insurance company buys this piece of garbage from you and tries to turn it into money. That's the auto salvage industry. So uh, a, a lot of different stuff. Uh, uh, but don't hold it against me. I did go to UCLA Engineering. Uh, I think it's actually a credit to USC. I end up on this campus 10 times as much as I'm on US, uh, UCLA's campus. So uh, I, I think that's actually pretty amazing. Uh, so I met my, so I uh, worked in a bunch of different industries and then met my co-founder uh, about eight years ago. And we, uh, you know, he studied robotics at, at USC. I'd studied computer science at UCLA. Uh, and we both, I guess this is cutting out. Uh, all right, well, let's, hopefully that still works. Uh, but we both wanted something else to do nights and weekends. And you know, part of our original premise was out of home entertainment hasn't changed since like laser tag and mini golf. You know, I mean, like all, there's. Meanwhile, there's all this great new tech, but yet none of it was really being apl applied to entertainment. And uh, and we wanted something else to do, so we just started building interactive art. Uh, this was an early thing we did called Artfall, which was just a, uh, this will be easier. We basically had a, a point at a projector and a camera at a whiteboard, and, and you would draw on the whiteboard, and then it would pick up what you'd done, and, and uh, circles and squares would sort of bounce off of it. Fun, simple, we took it to parties and events, and people loved it, and so we got inspired and started making more stuff, and we challenged ourselves to make something new every single month. And you know, when you, when you force yourself to throw a lot of stuff against the wall, it's something really powerful happens. First, you come up with a ton of terrible things. <laughs> but the neat part is, is while you're engaged in doing that, you come up with some stuff that ends, ends up being good. And, and we, uh, one of the things we enjoyed was this was a six player game table. We took a bunch of classic uh, video game components and made just a really simple game. But the thing that was so powerful was six is a really important number. You come to parties and events in twos and fours. Six kind of guarantees you're meeting somebody new around this, this, this game table. And uh, so it, we, we spent about a year making all this different kind of stuff. We flooded a room with fog and laser beams and gave, gave you the opportunity to sort of do a Mission Impossible style uh, uh, break in. Uh, this was one of the really terrible ones. We said, hey, isn't, you know, Rock Band is awesome. What if we could do Rock Band for space battle? You'll have the pilot, the gunner, and the navigator in one ship, and the pilot, the gunner, and the navigator in another ship, and then they'll like do battle. So we spent like a month building this thing. We were so excited. We finally install it, and nobody could play it at all. It was like impossible to play. Nobody was like, where am I? What am I doing? You know? So that thing saw the light of day for like 35 seconds. Uh, so, and generally, that's been a good thread for us. If my co-founder and I are really excited about it, it's probably going to fall flat. The stuff that we just sort of like throw, you know, throw out the door ends up being the most fun stuff. Uh, you know, and these were some uh, more really simple things, just walls of buttons, but you know, gave people the opportunity to sort of play whack-a-mole and Twister in really fun ways. You know, it's pretty funny. You get four people playing Twister against this wall, and they're all tangled up like pretzels. Uh, it's sort of kind of a good dating game. Uh, <laughs> So uh, as, as, as David mentioned, uh, it, was, it was around this time that, that uh, brands started to reach out to us. And so uh, the first one was Microsoft. They said, hey, guys, would you do our E3 party? You know, bring all that, that entertainment to our party. We'll pay you. And we're like, whoa, there's a business model here? Like, we've just been playing around. Uh, and so that was fun. And, and it, then the band OK Go uh, uh, came to us. And they said, and they were the guys, if you ever remember, they danced on the treadmills and whatnot. Uh, and they were like, hey, we'd love to be able to dance with a machine. 
And we sort of thought about it. We're like, dance with a machine. Man, that's tough. Uh, what about a Rube Goldberg machine? And instead of, instead of dancing with it, it abuses you a little bit. Is that OK? Uh, and they were like, yeah, that sounds great. So it started like this, uh, and, and it ended like this. Has, have you guys seen this video before? Should, uh, did you, Jay, would you like me to play it? OK. The funny thing about Rube Goldberg machines is the, the fact that they look like they're about to not work is exactly right. They're not going to work, right? So we finished this project like just hating Rube Goldberg machines. We were like, oh, this was, a you know, never again, never another Rube Goldberg machine. Of course, Madison Avenue started calling saying, hey, we want a viral video too. Would you make us a Rube Goldberg machine? And we're like, oh yeah, sure, we'll just throw the viral switch. You know, yeah, no problem. Uh, and, uh, but we, we, you know, we, so we're saying, no, no, left or right, we don't want to do any more Rube Goldberg machines. Uh, and then Google called, and we were like, oh man, but you're Google, all right. Well, and then we were like, okay, we're gonna, we're, we will do it if we can, on one condition, if we can use lasers and fire and robots. And they were like, okay. So we made that one. So I'm gonna show you that one too. Mm -hmm. 
la vie est là qui vous prend par le bras oh la 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 c'est magnifique des jours tout bleus des baisers lumineux c'est magnifique donner son cœur avec un bouquet de fleurs oh la 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 mais c'est magnifique de faire un jour un mariage d'amour c'est magnifique oh la 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 c'est magnifique avoir de cœur pour faire un seul bonheur oh la 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 mais c'est magnifique s'aimer d'amour à Paris pour toujours c'est magnifique Google presents the first global online science fair. You, you can buy glow stick fluid by the five gallon drum. And uh, it was, that, was, that was pretty exciting until we learned that there was almost no container that can contain this stuff, that it doesn't just burn through. And, and funny enough, every, uh, every one of our team, just like a regular science fair, we'd all sort of brought our projects that was the portion of the machine, and we're all underneath those tables. So unlike a normal science fair, we were standing next to it, we were all underneath it so we could reset it quickly. Uh, and my co-founder was the one underneath with the big syringe to pump all the, uh, 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 the glow stick fluid through. I can't believe we give that stuff to kids. I mean, it is just ridiculous. It's probably the worst stuff we've ever dealt with. Uh, so, um, we, so then we started taking on like much more uh, different kinds of projects, but they all sort of had this thread of real life engineering. And you know, at a time when a lot of people were doing computer animation and just sort of faking a lot of stuff, we'd roll in with like, you know, Caltech PhD candidates and you know, physics and electronics and robotics and we could build things for real. So uh, for, for, state, uh, for uh, uh, die hard batteries, we took 25 black and white cars out to the desert and we arranged them like a big piano. And then we hooked them all up to a single battery and compromised uh, all their electronics so that we could control them from a, from a MIDI keyboard. Uh, so that basically someone could play music on the keyboard and have it all translate to the cars. Their horn would go off and the lights would turn on. So uh, we got Gary Newman, uh, old school guy, uh, to play the song Cars on the Cars. We powered a cube of lights, a double stack keyboard, 24 cars without batteries, and Gary Newman. All with one diehard platinum battery. So the thing that was pretty funny about that was it was such a, you know, the, the build went all the way up to the last minute that it possibly could. The client was there pulling their hair out, you know, like, is it going to work? What's going on? Is everything ready? My co-founder's going nuts. And then we finally pulled the whole thing together. And, and uh, but, you know, there's, there, there's you, you can't make that stuff up. You know, it's, not, it's when you're faking it, it's sort of a lot easier. When you've got to make the engineering really work, we're out in the baking sun, like, uh, it, was a, it was a nightmare. But the best, and the funny part was all those cars were just destroyed by the time we were done. But, the, but don't worry, they were all rentals. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, so so uh, right after that, we ended up as the on-camera inventors for Extreme Makeover. We would build some new invention for each one of their families, and, and uh, uh, so that was a lot of fun. And, and the, the part that was the most fascinating to us, though, was uh, for, for the OK Go video, the Google video, and the times that we were on Extreme Makeover, we got all these calls from teachers. And the teachers would say, hey, thanks so much for making that reboot machine or whatnot. We used that in our physics class, and our kids were really excited. They were really inspired. We made our own. They'd send us videos of the Rube Goldberg machines that they'd make. Uh, uh, the same with these. This was a high-tech puppet show we made that uh, uh, had a bunch of sensors in it that we could control these robots. Uh, and, and, and so we kept getting these calls from teachers. And we sort of kept filing that away, but it started to sort of influence part of our, our direction and our company. Um, 
So it was then that we founded Two Bit Circus. So before that, we'd sort of been like a drinking club with an art problem. Uh, and, and then we were like, okay, let's turn this into a real company. Um, and uh, so, so we, we got all our favorite inventors, all our favorite nerds, and uh, got a huge, nice uh, warehouse in downtown LA. It's a big old power plant with 50-foot ceilings, and, and uh, it's, it's nice. Power plants are steam-powered, and so are we, so we sort of liked that. Uh, so, so we found a two-bit uh, with the goal to really you know, focus on the future of entertainment, building novel forms of entertainment, using lots of different kind of sensors and, and, and actuators and outputs and, and whatnot. Uh, and uh, so we've got a, a bunch of different lines of business. Um, and uh, we do uh, big, you know, crazy installations for, 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 uh, uh, for brands, applying sort of our understanding of out-of-home entertainment to novel uh, forms of storytelling. This, we took a whole array of GoPros facing in every direction, strapped it to the top of, a, of an Indy car, and uh, then drove that at 200 miles an hour around a racetrack. And so then we stitched all that footage together into a big sphere of video so that you could put on an Oculus Rift and uh, sit in a motion platform and feel what it's like to drive in an Indy car. And the, the thing moves, you're getting blasted in the face with, with, uh, with air, and you're safely seated in a thing that's not moving at all. Uh, and, and you think about you know, what, what the fact that virtual reality now exists, what that unlocks, is all sorts of entertainment experiences that would be totally inaccessible to you, right? You might not be able to go because you don't have enough money, because you don't have the access, because you don't have the time. There's so many different things. I mean, for me, the one that I would love to do is the seal incursion, right? Where you jump out of a helicopter into the ocean, swim ashore, put on night vision goggles, and storm the castle. When am I gonna get to do that? Never, right? But, but with this kind of style that you sort of unlocks the ability to be able to pull that stuff off. Uh, oh, this is out of order. Well, whatever. Uh, so we also, so, so, we'll, so we'll do those, those sorts of installations for big brands. Uh, we do, we continue to do events. We do huge events for, for Intel and Amazon and all the, you know, Fortune 100 companies uh, bringing this, you know, basically like Cirque du Soleil for interactivity. We come in with a whole bunch of interactive stuff, get people playing together, having fun, uh, all ages. Um, and. Uh, I figured I'd do, run run through a little bit of like a little bit of our creative process and the stuff that that that, that we do to sort of stay creative and 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 work at our shop. Um, and one of my favorites is what I, is, is what I call random input. And you know you can you, you imagine that you could have a life that consisted of waking up and going to school and going home and going to bed and waking up and going home and going to school and and just rinse and repeat, right? Well, at any moment that you needed to kind of have, solve a problem or come up with a solution or whatnot, you're only ever going to be drawing on your own life experience, right? A really narrow set of life experience. But the more life experience you have, the more varied things that you expose yourself to, the more you're going to be able to draw on at the time that you go to solve that problem. So if you up your random input, you start to be able to really have a lot of things to draw on. So like one of my favorite things to do is conference crash. Find some random conference that has nothing to do with what you're focused on and just, just sneak in. Uh, and I can teach you all sorts of ways to sneak into conferences. It's super easy. Uh, but you, you know, and, and you'll, be, you'll be surprised. Next time you're in Las Vegas, you're there for a bachelor party or whatever, and you, would, you ask the cabbie for their list of conferences. They all have one, and it's based on an 8 and a half by 11 sheet of paper, and it's got, you know, it, you know CES, you know, Las Vegas Convention Center, 300 million people. And then underneath that's like the actuary convention, you know, <laughs> the Hilton, 500 people, uh, vacuum cleaners, you know, whatever. You should go down the list. And there's all sorts of weird stuff, things you wouldn't even believe would constitute a conference, and it's totally hilarious. And really, you know, I mean, I've been to a lot of weird conferences. I mean, packaging and auto salvage and, uh, you know, whatnot. But, every, but you'd be surprised how much uh, some problem that you're thinking about in the back of your head is going to be influenced by stuff, you know, some new innovation in that domain. I, you know, I believe a lot of creativity comes from the intersection of domains. So, you know, something that's happening over here might start to really affect sort of where you are in, in, uh, in your life. I got a, a friend, a writer friend, whenever he's got writer's block, he just gets on the bus. And, and he'll just, and he doesn't have any idea where he's going or whatnot. He tries to imagine the story of everybody getting off the bus. And then he's got the added adventure of wherever the hell the bus drops him, he's got to figure out how to get home. <laughs> uh, and then the last one that I really like is travel like a peasant. Uh, you know, can you live on five bucks a day? You know, that would really, that's really sort of forces you into sort of interesting thinking and, and, and whatnot. Uh, Okay, another one, brainstorming. So this one, I really, this is a thread I really like a lot. You ha I, I, I'm gonna give you just one assignment, I promise you'll, for, you'll, you'll thank me. Watch John Cleese's talk on creativity. 
So he gave this to a, to a school, and in typical John Cleese fashion, he's all over the place. But it's totally amazing. And he talks about one thing uh, called intermediate impossibles. So intermediate impossibles are really important when it comes to brainstorming. So everybody knows the sort of really negative, cynic person, right, that, that really poo-poo's on ideas and sort of is just really terrible to have around. Uh, well, uh, Disney had an approach to, to brainstorming that I love. and, and he basically would, would had three different rooms, physically three different rooms. And so he'd go into the first room was the dreamer room. This is when the no wrong answer, throw as much stuff against the wall, right? Cambrian explosion, ever, there's, it doesn't have to adhere to the laws of physics, economics, nothing. You just, whatever, no wrong answer. And the, the intermediate, this is where the intermediate impossibles come in. Because if we're talking about medical devices, and I say pirates, you know, everybody might be like, pirates? Dude, what does that have to do with medical devices? But that gets you thinking about, wow, yeah, well, the hook might be able to be something we could use to latch on to it, whatever, right? So that intermediate impossible, the fact that pirates has nothing to do with medical devices, has got everybody thinking in sort of a new direction that might now lead us to something that is actually valuable and important. Uh, so then he moves into the spoiler room. And the spoiler room is now where we start to apply uh, uh, some constraints. So, you know, is this possible? Does it, does it adhere to the laws of physics? Is this going to, you know, follow economics? Is this something that is, you know, uh, going to work? And so this, so you've sort of cut down the, the, the set of ideas that we developed in the brain, in the, in the dreamer phase into a, now a smaller set. And then finally he'd move into the realist room and this was like, of all the things that survived the, the, the spoiler room, what are we actually going to work on? Uh, and so that three-part set is really a, 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 a powerful piece. We use this all the time at 2-Bit, really effective. Uh, so access to tools. This has never been more relevant than now. Like, you know, whether you're working with metal or wood or software or whatever, the tools are freaking ridiculous. Stuff that used to take a PhD can be operated by your little five-year-old brother now on an iPad. It's cuckoo. And, you know, I mean, and, and whether you're, you know, routing out a piece of wood or laser cutting, you know, marble, you know, it's getting just awesome. And so you, you're, you're, you, the opportunities to be creative and, 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 and whatnot have just, just go through the roof when you've got really great access to tools. You guys have all of that here at, at, uh, at USC, so, so access tool is a really big one. Um, stimulating environment, uh, we, we, you know, not, we try to not just run a, you know, a company nine to five, but we have a happy hour and we have a game night and we, have, you know, we run uh, all sorts of different things that gets you know, other people from outside of our company to come in and do interesting things and, and, and share what they're working on. We even had a really top secret nerd night, uh, just like Fight Club, it's, if it's your first time, you have to present. Uh, and, uh, but you know, all of that sort of gets more of that random input, more of that churn of ideas and whatnot, really, really uh, important. Um, mentorship. Uh, so this one is, is something I really love. Personally, I spend a lot of time mentoring uh, kids, and I would encourage all of you guys to also. And, and mentorship is nuts, because not only is it super valuable for you know, every kid who, who you would be mentoring, we have, we have neurons in our brain, mirror neurons, built directly to look at another human and emulate what they're doing. So you know, the current setup for school of 30, you know, 30 kids in a classroom, that teacher can never give that, to that kid the, the kind of time and attention that they need. But you, know, you guys, every one of you has something to teach these kids. But here's the thing that's even more interesting. But the act of mentoring releases oxytocin. So you end up in a better place for having mentored. For, you know, not, not, not only is the kid better, but you're now better off. Even more nuts, the act of watching somebody else mentor releases oxytocin. So I mean, it's really, it just, everybody wins. <laughs> uh, and, and you also get access to a lot of interesting creativity. Kids come up with all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, Play, I'm gonna just skip over that. Uh, Cross-disciplinary, well this one is actually sort of interesting. Uh, uh, we have a really broad, broad spectrum of people and I think that when, especially when you're trying to solve a problem, having lots of different perspectives in the room is really important uh, because you, you know, we'll get a, a physicist and a, a roboticist, an electrical engineer and a unicyclist all coming up with an idea and they, everybody's sort of drawing from their own uh, experiences in order to be able to, to solve that problem. So cross-disciplinary is really important. Uh, okay, so how am I doing on time, by the way? Lauren, is this, I have like, uh, yeah, 10 more minutes, okay, good. So uh, I'm gonna talk to you about the, the, the sort of the last part of the presentation, which is uh, our uh, current big project for us. Uh, uh, David alluded to it, uh, we, we threw a huge event in Los Angeles, uh, and, and, and basically 90,000 square feet, it was a huge high-tech carnival. And uh, 
you know, I'm arguably a STEM guy. A lot of our team are STEM people. If you heard this term, science, technology, engineering, and math. And, you know, this is a uh, old school term that the, the government and education sort of used to cabbage on to, to the need for more of this stuff in our schools. Not a lot of kids, especially America, want to be STEM kids. Uh, and that sucks. But really, every, this is what everybody thinks of when they think of a STEM kid, right? You know, not exactly desirable. Um, and, and, you know, and then and, and after he's in this phase, it's, you know, pencil ties and lab coats and a very boring life. And the reality is, it's so not like that anymore. The tools are getting freaking awesome. I mean, we're all STEM guys, and we're getting to play with lasers and fire and robots and bungee jump cars and do all sorts of ridiculous stuff. It's not anything like this. So I, I like to think more of Da Vinci, right? Was he a STEM guy? No, nah, I guess, yeah, okay, scientist and engineer, but he was also an inventor and an artist and you know, had oh, this whole broader spectrum of skill sets. And so for us, the, the, the term STEAM was, was way cooler. Uh, and and I, I think of this quote, if, if, uh, uh, this guy's heard it before, awesome, this is one of my favorite quotes, and that's actually the beginning of this, and so if you indulge me, I'm gonna read you this because I think it's one of the coolest quotes. A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. Wow, awesome, right? I mean, that's, that's totally wonderful. Wouldn't you love to be able to do all those things, right? You know, because, you know, you, know, you get in a, into a, you, you pop your tire, you want to be able to change that, you want to be able to cook a nice meal for your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever. Like, you know, having broad spectrum of skill sets is, is a, a, you know, applicable everywhere. Uh, so why, are, why do we care about, about STEM and STEAM now? Well, it's particularly important right now. Uh, and if you ask a venture capitalist, this, they, whenever you try to pitch a venture capitalist, they always are going to ask you, why now? What's special? And so for things like YouTube and Dropbox, the answer was really clear, right? There was more bandwidth penetration than there had ever been. Storage was at an unbelievable price. You know, you can, you know, I can bore you with graphs. Uh, but, you know, there was a really particular time that made that really possible. People had tried it before and it was too early. Then, you know, Dropbox and YouTube, there was really the right time. Okay. So for us, it's really the right time because, you know, U.S., uh, let's see, we rank 47th in math and science instruction. Huh, I mean, that's pretty terrible. I mean, I don't know how many, yeah, that's a lot of uh, bad, that's a lot of bad. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we, you know, and, and, and the stats are just terrible, right? And not only do we rank, not, you know, not only are we not graduating enough of them, but the ones we are graduating aren't that good. I mean, that's really a, a, a pretty horrible situation. Uh, I also bring up this, so we do a lot of work with Intel, and they have a chip, they have their developer conference every year. Now, the Intel Developer Conference is arguably the nerdiest conference on the planet, right? But, you know, we've gone for a number of years, and it always has been the nerdiest, most undesirable conference on the planet. And you know what happened this year? We ran into artists and, and theater people and, you know, these the fashion designers. I mean, it was like, what was going on? All of, the, all of a sudden, the world had changed, right? All those tools that, my, that, that Intel was making were now accessible to a whole new, broader range of people. And so the concept of being an artist had completely reset because all of a sudden, your palette of tools was not just a paintbrush and clay or whatnot, but like freaking crazy awesome processors and all the sort of beef that goes behind like the whole technology industry. So, so okay, more, another important thing about it being the time. Uh, uh, just to underscore the fact, if you want to, the, the, the fundamental test in computer science, uh, uh, sort of the introductory thing is can you print hello world? So in 1980, this is what that looked like. I'm a computer scientist and that sucks. Okay, that's not fun, it's not intuitive. Uh, and in 1990, it looked like that. Okay, getting a little better, uh, but still, what's this pound include, SDIO, blah, blah, blah. Well, nowadays, it looks like that. And in fact, it's actually getting even better than that. You can do it on your iPad and pictures and like all sorts of craziness. You know, yeah, there's hello world now, right? Okay. So, so what, what's this to say? The tools are better than they've ever been, right? So you've got all of this capability and, 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 and yet we've got this sort of branding problem. So, uh, I've got more examples than I need here. This is teaching kids algebra with iPads. This is what CAD used to look like. Now it looks like this on an iPad. Again, your kid can do it. So, okay, another favorite quote. Madeline Engel, inspiration comes during work, not before it. So you don't just like on the couch 
approach to like and have like a light bulb moment, you're actively engaged in something, it's trying to solve a problem, and that's when you realize, oh man, this could be done so much better. Holy mackerel, you know, this is a this there I can't believe people are doing it like this. We gotta do this something differently. There's an efficiency that can be derived here. So you've got to just actively just just start, you know, if you if you're having trouble uh, uh, figuring out what to do, just start something and it'll sort of get the wheels turning. Five minutes, okay. Uh, Okay, I've got way too many slides here. Okay, uh, so okay, so we launched this big crazy high tech carnival. We did it on Kickstarter, uh, which was really a funny uh, story because you know everybody else on Kickstarter was like, "Hey, we're gonna sell you a watch," and really anybody in the world can be a customer. We were like, "Hey, we want to do an event. It's gonna be in Los Angeles and San Francisco. We're not gonna tell you when or where. Want to buy a ticket?" Uh, it was a little bit of a hard sell, but the thing that happened is it really worked. I mean, it got, it got us on Discovery Channel and Time Magazine, USA Today. It was like went all over the internet. We even had Martha Stewart tweet about it, uh, which was hilarious because, you know, we were like, oh my God, we totally made it. Martha Stewart's tweeting about us. Uh, uh, we were on stage at All Things Digital with, with Walt Mossberg and Kara Swisher swinging a big carnival hammer. It was ridiculous. Uh, so we did it in Los Angeles. Uh, we had about 13,000 people come through, uh, uh, 90,000 square feet. It was five events. Uh, uh, we had a, a gala with David there. It was amazing. We, we sort of, the gala formula is very tired and terrible. Uh, so we wanted to sort of really reinvent that. So we, you know, in the food, nothing was as it, we had all sorts of flavor tripping. There's this, this uh, uh, Chinese flower I encourage you to get that um, uh, is an analgesic, makes your mouth feel like it's foaming. So we put that in the salad. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the dessert was like a sort of a, a bitter, sour, uh, uh, the goat cheese and strawberry parfait. And we gave you the special berry that when you eat it, it disables your tongue's ability to taste sour. So everything tastes sweet. So then all of a sudden, the dessert tasted awesome. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a pretty, and then, and then at the end, we did uh, uh, dunk ourselves into a fire. So your regular dunk tank, right? You get dropped into water. Uh, so we built a dunk tank, and there's someone throws a ball, hits the target, and you get enveloped in this big fireball. So there's uh, my co-founder, and then you get completely devoured. So that was pretty fun. Uh, I have a video, but I'll, I'll skip that. I think I'm out of time here. Uh, so why don't we end the, oh, I, This is how we pitched it. I always joked so that this was our over-promising rendering. <laughs> it's not going to look like that, but man, wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, so anyway, okay. Well, why don't we why don't we cut it there? Uh, I, I have more, but I'll stop. <laughs> uh, I think we have time for just a couple of quick questions. Uh, yeah, so I've always personally loved uh, street art and, and graffiti, and you know, for me, there's like the, the, this uh, a counterculture aspect to it that I've always appreciated. You know, I, I, I sort of always have faith in humanity as long as like somebody's tagging something, you know, because it's kind of I don't know something that's sort of a uh, I always appreciate. And I think as an entrepreneur, you sort of have to like not you have to be willing to sort of thumb your nose at, at things every now and again. You know? So for me, graffiti always sort of represented that. And so this was like before camera phones or anything, I would go around LA and with a, with a GPS and a phone, I would take, or and a, and a camera, I would take pictures and tag the, tag the location so that I could watch how various areas evolved. Uh, but it was just a sort of fun sort of personal project. Uh, so, th you know, 3D printing is interesting. I think people conflate 3D printing with sort of all the rest of the cool tools that are out there. 3D, consumer 3D printing right now, still pretty lame. Like, it, you know, a thousand dollar 3D printer, like, we have one that's just collecting dust on the ground, we never use it. Our laser cutter, constantly in use. Uh, and so I think that 3D printing, like, got a lot of airplay because it's like, wow, oh my god, you're gonna be able to print everything, you never need to buy anything again. We are so far from that. Uh, and, uh, but, but I think that what people mean when they say, wow, 3D printing is so awesome, is like laser cutters are awesome and CNC router tables are awesome and all of the other stuff that it takes to do that and even the tools that it takes to create what you would 3D print are getting amazing. Uh, and so, I, you know, I'm bullish on the 3D printers. I'm excited, you know, that they'll be, they'll be great. And, you know, you, you go and tour SpaceX, they have a 3D printer that prints in titanium. So they take it out of the printer and they put it in a rocket. So, awesome. All right, now that's a 3D printer I want. Of course, it's a million bucks. Uh, but, you know, that, so I think it's going to be something special and interesting, but is, is uh, not quite there yet.
Oh, man. Somebody could, it doesn't even have to be you. What would you like yeah. somebody to do? So we've got a whole list at our company called Long Term To Do. <laughs> uh, and so we have a, just a ton of things like that. Um, as far as like big problems that I would love to have to see solved, like God, I'm gonna have to think about that. You have to give me some time with that. <laughs> Sorry, that's not a good answer, but I don't have one off the top of my head. I mean, we want to make our own robot band and a whole bunch of other stuff. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, awesome question. Uh, so all of you, please be diligent with your contact list. So here's a really interesting thing. Over the course of your time as an entrepreneur, you're going to need everything. A great lawyer, an amazing accountant, a crazy JavaScript developer, a, you know, a, a, an auto mechanic, or whatever, right? And people are going to constantly surprise you at how awesome they are at one of those things. But you might not need those things right now. And, and so, you know, for me, I just put it in the notes field of, of the context data. Like, you know, JavaScript developer met this way, blah, blah, blah. But the more you have, like, this database that you can go back to, the more, val the, the more valuable you will be as an entrepreneur because you are, you, you're going to, you know, it's going to come up over and over and over again that you're going to need a private equity guy and a whatever. And so the, the, the more you have, you know, sort of access to that information, the, the better off you're going to be. Uh, and so as far as where we found that people, you know, we just went, you know, to lots of events, conferences, you know, I mean, again, the conference crashing thing, like you end up at, you know, interesting conferences, interesting people go to, you know, and so they're, they're talking about interesting stuff and, you know, go and, go and have beers with them afterwards and, you know, just collect interesting people in as many different places as you can and then be good about, you know, keeping track of them in some capacity. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. You know, I uh, was raised kind of as an entrepreneur, so I feel like I always sort of knew that I wanted to do that in, in, in some capacity. Uh, and so I always sort of had little businesses on the side. Uh, and I think that, you know, once we, the big, the, the two bit was sort of the first time I really felt like all the things had lined up, you know, and so it was really clear because we like had a, we had, you know, we didn't actually know, we didn't raise money, so we didn't, we weren't really entirely sure what we wanted to do. We sort of knew the general direction wave guide that we were going to go. Uh, but, but the fact that we sort of had a couple of great team members, we had a cool project that was going to sort of get us cash flow, uh, made it like the obvious choice. Uh, and, and so my advice always to, to people who have a full-time job is, you know, tinker, play with stuff, try lots of different things, throw a ton of shit against the wall, and then once you, once the thing that you, that starts to get traction starts to impact your work, right, you know, then, then at that point you can start to think about making the jump. So, uh, you know, first ask your boss, hey, can I take Fridays off? And, and so you've sort of reduced your time there and you've increased your time on your side project. And then you're like, well, hey, can I work two days from home? And, you know, you know this is like a four-hour work week method, right? Uh, and, you know, the more that you can sort of, you know, you've got your, what my dad used to call the rocket ship and the lifeboat. You, you don't want to kick your lifeboat to the curb until you're really sort of ready with the rocket ship. Um, hope that helps answer your question. All right, you, you got to head out. I got to run. Um, we, we got a couple of lovely parting gifts, but we'll do oh, those two later. Oh, great. Do you oh, take wait. those with you? Oh, thanks but a lot. Let's, wow. let's thank Brent for stepping in on no notice. <laughs> thanks, Brent. Thanks, Brent. Thank you. Oh, here. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. 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 Thank you